You've thought about joining a book club, but there's one problem. You're too busy, or buying books aren't in your budget, or some books aren't in the format that you can access, or you lose interest before you can finish, or maybe you have no interest in reading the book. Whatever the reason, there is a book club for that. Here at Book Interrupted, reading the book is not a prerequisite for joining the conversation. It's about connecting and celebrating life's interruptions. Join the community by following us on Facebook or contact us through our website at www.bookinterrupted.com fans. We'd love to hear from you. Parental guidance is recommended because this episode has mature topics and strong language. Here are some moments you can look forward to during this episode of Book Interrupted. Just to make this podcast, we probably need hundreds of people just to do this. We'll come up with like a good prize, but also we'll the send them book. like glitter copy. <laughs> <laughs> My son got to the point where he's like, can I have this? And you'd be like, yep. And he'd be like, and he would just sit there. And yeah, like, yeah. So go get it. Yeah, it sounds like a threat, right? But I wouldn't say that. But like, because we all want to be part of the group. Demand of me yeah. to become more comfortable with trust. Always sharing what they have with the You're people around them. You're like, it's not yours. Them. That's mm. nice. My body and soul. The inflammation is the goal. Try to love something new. Without me, it's <laughs> Disrupted mind, body, and soul. Uh, Inspiration is with uh, and we're gonna talk it uh, out on Book Interrupted. Welcome to Book Interrupted, a book club for busy people to connect and one that celebrates life's interruptions. Hi, I'm Sarah. I started Book Interrupted and asked the closest people to me to be part of it. First, I asked my sister. Hi, I'm Meredith, the sister. My first friend. Hi, I'm Kim, the first friend. My old roommate. Hi, I'm Lindsay, the old roommate. My high school friend. Hi, I'm Kara, the high school friend. My good friend and Kara's sister. That's me. Hi, I'm Leah, Sarah's friend, Kara's sister, and the final member of Book Interrupted. If you'd like to join along, this book cycle is from August 1st to September 5th. It's Leah's book pick, and we're reading Sapiens by Yuval Noah Harari. Sapiens explores how human history has shaped our societies, the plants and animals around us, and even our personalities. First published in 2014, Sapiens, A Brief History of Humankind by Yuval Noah Harari, has sold 16 million copies and has been translated into 60 languages. It is a New York Times bestseller and held position number one to three on the Sunday Times bestseller list for 96 consecutive weeks. The Guardian has credited Sapiens with revolutionizing the nonfiction market and popularizing brainy books. In 2020, Harari, along with comics artists David Vandermeulen and Daniel Casanave, created the first volume of Sapiens A Graphic History, a graphic novel adaptation of the original. All right, so it's personal journal time. Let's see what the members of Book Interrupted thought outside the group. Hello again from the Tattoo Forest. Ah, uh, so I wanted to talk to you today about the book Sapiens by Yuval Noah Harari. So this is my book choice. I'm really excited about it. Clearly, I picked this book before I knew what I was getting into with this book club. I had... Like at that point when we were picking books, I didn't really know the turnaround time on reading a book. I am a slow reader. I picked this book because I was in the middle of reading it. I'm on page 87 when we chose books. And so I put it away for today to start reading it later for this book club. And I chose this book for a lot of reasons. It has a lot of buzz around it. Lots of people were talking about this book and how great it is. I heard a couple podcasts, namely, I think it was Joe Rogan, and he had Yuval on, and it sounded fascinating. And from what I read, it is fascinating. There's no way I will be able to finish this before in the amount of time we have to read it. So that's going to suck, but that's life. I'm really, really excited about it. I also, just because I know 
he I know the sound of his voice. Um, I think I'll probably get it in an book on tape, like audio format as well, because he's got a beautiful voice, beautiful accent. And that's always nice when you can listen and read for just like practical life. I'd love that. I really hope he narrates his own books. So I guess we'll find out. And um, I'm just like looking forward to it. It's a good read. Just so interesting. Just so many little tidbits. I don't really have much else to say about it. I'm just excited. And I'm, I guess, a little bit excited, a little bit apprehensive about it being my book choice. And hopefully other people enjoy the book. But I don't, I guess it shouldn't really matter. It's not really like I wrote the dang thing. Yeah, I'm just uh, happy to get to my book choice and feel a little bit guilty about subjecting everyone to how many pages? How many? I think 400 plus pages. Yeah, that should be, that should be really doable. I know some girlies in the group will definitely read it all because I think this because of just like their personality type. I feel like Mare will because I, I, have, I think she's like a crazy, crazy fast reader. I don't know if Sarah is a crazy fast reader, but she's like a, she would feel like bad if she didn't finish a book. So this should be really a, just a great torture for the girl. <laughs> Keeping her up all night. Like, because she doesn't need sleep. She only has three children. So I feel like they're definitely going to finish. I feel like my sister will not finish. In fact, I I think she'll like skim. <laughs> I don't feel like this will be her love book. And KG and Lindsay probably won't finish, but I think they'll both enjoy it. Those are my predictions. I think my sister won't not like the book. I just think she'll, I don't think it's her type of book. Mm, that's all I got to say about that. And... Enjoy Sapiens, everybody. I hope you like it. This is my first personal journal for the book, Sapiens. This is the book I've been most excited to read for the Book Interrupted podcast. I'm really happy that Leah chose it. I like to read a lot of science books, as I've said before. Typically, I read about things like uh, genetics and biology. I've read a little bit of evolution as well, but nothing specific about human evolution or our cultural evolution, I suppose. So I'm looking really forward to this. It's pretty thick, which everybody's a little worried about. When I get into a good science book, I have a trouble putting it down. So I think that might not be a huge problem with this. Although I think it's going to make me think about a lot of things. I think it's pretty common in our society for people to talk about certain human behaviors in reference to evolution. And certainly when I know I'm thinking about a certain human behavior, I think about where does this fit in with evolution? So I'm pretty ignorant on that, on human evolution specifically. So I'm looking forward to, to finding out a little bit more and maybe be able to make those comments, not out of a place of ignorance, but with a little bit more insight. The book does seem to be uh, referenced in the back, which is always a good sign and got really great reviews. So I'm really looking forward to it. I don't know what else there is to say. I appreciate that there's an index in the back because I can go back to certain ideas and read over them again. I think this is going to be one of those books that I'll want to read it again after I let all those ideas kind of percolate a little bit. And it does talk about not just the past, but the future of the human race, which is, I think, it's front of mind for a lot of people, particularly in light of the climate crisis that we're going through right now. That's all I have to say. Looking forward to it. Oh my God. So this is my personal journal for Sapiens, starting the Sapiens. I just started it yesterday night, like evening. I'm already like, I can't put it down. I'm 63 pages in. I'm like, I can't. It's so good. Like I was nervous because it's so big and kind of all of us have been talking about like how it's such a long book, like we hope we get through it, blah, blah, blah. But I literally can't put it down. It, the way he writes too, like I thought maybe the information would be dry and you're just trying to get through it. I don't know. He's just, this author is just brilliant. Like the way he pieces it all together even, it just keeps you wanting to learn more. I'm so excited about this book. I don't really know a lot about the history of man and I'm finding it so fascinating already. I can't wait to get into more of what happens when we become conscious and whatever. I was also interested that like there was, I think he said there was six, four, six. It's, at one point he said four, and I think another point he named, I think, six different types of humans, which I also think is super fascinating and how 
It would be interesting to see if the we like took the mother out, the others out. I like that they said they found some DNA, but they still think it's a combination of basically taking them out. And it's interesting how our imaginations, what made us evolve past just being part of nature, right? Because really we're not, we like separated ourselves from nature basically because of our imagination is what I'm getting out of it. Yeah, we can create fiction, which other humans couldn't and other animals don't. Like it's just whatever they see, not like their senses, right? But we use our mind to imagine what we can't see. And, and I like how he puts it towards like, not just everything, not just like religion and beliefs, but also like money constructs and corporations. Like that also was amazing. I never even thought about corporations that way. It's so good. I can't wait to read more. I'm excited what I have to say in the next personal journal. And I wonder if everyone else is like going through it really quick too. Anyway, great book. All right. Personal journal number one for the book Sapiens. This would normally be the time uh, that I, well, at least historically, would be holding up the book and showing it off. However, I can't find the book anywhere in this house. My husband got it over two years ago. He totally loved the book. He read it, I think, in less than five days, which is annoyingly normal for Bob because he is such a good reader and he's so fast too. He just like he just eats it all up. And then I, of course, looked at the size of the book and I was like, whoa, I'm gonna need to set aside a whole year to get through that one. Like world's slowest reader. But anyways. So I am very excited to start this book. I've been waiting for two years for the right time uh, to indulge in it. And uh, the time is now, and yet the like it is not in the house. I have no idea where it is. I've been looking everywhere. I'm pretty sure that the moment I drop the search, I'm going to end up finding the book. But until then, uh, you know what? I just, I was saying to Sarah that I feel kind of like, I don't know, is it too frivolous, like with it being COVID and we're trying to pay more attention to how we're spending just because we're not bringing in as much uh, as we used to. I've been buying a lot of things online through Amazon. And so I'm like, I don't know if I can proceed with the uh, with the purchase of an audio book. But you know what, I'm just going to do it because I've been looking forward to reading Sapiens for so long. I cannot find the actual tangible copy in our home. And I think really the only way I'm going to get through such a large book in six weeks is doing it the good old fashioned audiobook style. So probably after I sign off this personal journal, I will be making a purchase. And I absolutely can't wait. Uh, it's just such a fascinating topic. Uh, looking at humans, the human condition and how we evolved and we got to our modern world. So I can't wait to jump right in and uh, then share along with you on the journey. All right, take care, my friends. Hello, so this is my first personal journal for Sapiens, and uh, I'm looking forward to reading this book. I actually don't know a lot about it, which is, I think, the first book, maybe close to the first book that we've started to read that I don't know much about, and I actually am interested in that. I do know that people have enjoyed it. I have had friends recommend it to me. I know that it is about the history of humankind and that it's an enjoyable, easy read. And that's about it. So yeah, that's all I have to say. See you when I'm reading it and let you know what I think. Bye. Here it is. The book. This is how far in I am. But this is like how far in I was. And for all those listeners who can't see me, I'm about a third of the way in. That's how far I was in a year ago when I stopped reading it. So now I don't know what I'm going to do. I really like the info. I think it's really cool. I have a hard time with history. It's always been a subject that I was never really interested in. And I think it's, I actually ended up chalking it up to delivery because it's not actually history that's boring, but apparently it was either my attention span or the teachers who were giving me the info that I had the issue with. I worked with somebody in my early career after graduating college, and he taught, like we worked in a classroom together, he taught our class history, and that was great. So he was passionate, he had, he was very knowledgeable, and he had a great way of conveying the information, almost storyteller-like. So I don't know, maybe history in grade school for me was like too many timelines, you know, and a lot of whatever. Anyways, I realized when I met that gentleman who taught our class history, and I learned a lot of history through him at that time, that um, I don't actually not like history. It's just the way that it's delivered to me that matters. And so that brings us back to this book. 
it delivers history from a unique perspective and with a great storyteller's kind of vibe. So it is interesting, even for people who think that they might not like history. I'm looking forward to getting back into it, actually. So that is all I'm going to say right now. I might take it to the beach with me and get some chapters in. thing that's hard for me is the terminology, you know, homo sapien, homo erectus, and I don't know, sometimes I get lost in those kind of things. But the grand scheme of things, like the lessons or how, you know, we our ability to cooperate is what is what kind of favored us in evolution, those things I remember. So we'll see how it goes. Third of the way through, I will uh, report back when I'm further. If <laughs> I'll report back either way, but hopefully I'll be further when I do. Happy reading, y'all. This interruption is brought to you by Unpublished. Do you want to know more about the members and Book Interrupted? Go behind the scenes? Visit our website at www.bookinterrupted.com. Book Interrupted. My interruption is like the opposite of an interruption. So I have this new computer and now when I hook up my podcasting equipment, it just works so much better. The microphone is picking up less background noise and picking up more of my voice. So I don't have to try to make it as close to my face as possible. And the camera is so much better. It doesn't automatically adjust on its own if I don't want it to. So, I mean, all of this is just so fantastic. Book interrupted. Let's listen in to this episode's group discussion. My book choice is Sapiens, A Brief History of Humankind by Yuval Noah Harari. I can't find my copy anywhere, which again, I Pretty think big. is the problem. Yeah, giving me the uh, signal to just get the audio book. Have you read it already, Kara? Only little bits. Over a year ago when Bob was reading it in like less oh, than yeah, five yeah. days. And I was like, screw you. Who reads a book? God, this you know what? I might, have, I might have Bob's because did Bob give it to mom? Oh, <laughs> maybe. Yeah. You just Anyways. found it. Okay. Anyway. <laughs> there it is. You, you found, found your it. book. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I chose this book because when Sarah asked me to join the book club, I w- had just started reading it and I didn't know what I was signing up for. <laughs> and how fast I would need to read a book. And there is no, well, I shouldn't say there's no possibility, but the possibility that I'm going to finish this in the book cycle of how many weeks? Six. Six Uh, is unlikely, but I'm going to try because I feel like if I don't even try and I chose the book, that's just not fair. (laughs) So I'm going to try and I'm going to get it on audiobook too, because I know just from hearing interviews with him that he has this beautiful Israeli accent. I believe it's Israeli accent. So it's going to just, if he's narrating it, which I assume he would, it's going to sound like butter in your ears. And that'll help me take in some of the information because I've been falling asleep like a dead person every night. Like literally it takes me no time to fall asleep. I can read maybe 12 words before I fall asleep. (laughs) So is this because of the book or uh, because you're just very tired? I'm so tired. I think also I'm dealing with, I've never dealt with seasonal allergies before. And with my move into grass cutters, hell, people are really interested in maintaining their lawns here. And I've just been taking Claritin, which is an awful feeling for me all day. I feel like up and then really down. And then I like to occasionally (laughs) mix a bottle of wine in it. (laughs) <laughs> so <laughs> turns out makes for like maybe not successful days but excellent sleeps so just so you know <laughs> yeah so good luck to y'all reading this book i feel sorry for you for doing this to you it, but i think you'll enjoy an awesome the book from what i've read so far i just started yeah, I reading it, it last night and yeah. i well, I'm going to have the opposite problem. Like I had to, I Dan's like, we should go to bed. And I was like, yeah, and I'll just finish this section. I'm going to have trouble mm-hmm. putting, I'm having trouble putting it down. And I just started it. Mm-hmm. So um, interesting. He's it's, so funny. It? He's yeah. such a good writer and storyteller. And he's just so funny. Like, I just like, I'm laughing out loud already. Oh, good. Maybe I'm just a huge nerd. <laughs> no, no it's so I, stimulating. It's, it's so oh. I just started it last night as well. And I couldn't put it down. Um, the first thing I did when I woke up was pick it up and start reading again. Like, oh, nice. Yeah, I can't, it's, so, it's so good. I don't know what, like, <laughs> I thought, I mean, like, I thought it was going to be really dry and just about the history, history of mankind. But 
he writes really well. It's like a story of the history. Yeah, he really relates it like to a, today. Yeah, like a like yeah, he like writes that. like a non nonfiction with a lot of facts. It's almost feels yeah, yeah like a story. It's yeah. like Malcolm yeah. Gladwell esque. I feel like yeah, oh, yeah, yeah good call. That's a yeah. good way. Yeah. But, oh my gosh. If any of you have are looking for a podcast, Malcolm Gladwell's Revisionist History is like ugh. the only way I want to learn about history. I like his voice. Yeah, I like lots about him. So that's all I got to say about that. It's a beefy one. Now, I was she's intimidated big. by she's the size juicy. until I started reading it. Like it's, it okay. is definitely long, but I don't know. I think I'm just be like, maybe, you know, sometimes I don't like, it's hard for me to do things like ignore my kids because they hate that. But, you know, like go on a walk and read my book while they're biking or something. You walk while reading? How about you when you're reading? Do you walk and read? Yeah. What are you talking about? <laughs> oh, I walk and read too. I'm totally a walk reader. My whole yeah. life I've spent, as long as I've been able to read, I have walked, if I have to walk somewhere, it, especially when I was a kid and teenager and in my 20s, well, before kids, I would just walk and read. Walk yeah, I'm very good at like thing? paying attention and kind of listening to what's happening and keeping my periphery like open so I can see people or things or whatever. It's just that you, you can get used to it. Like I don't even like to check a text. Like I'll stop and read the text and then continue walking. I have to stop. Yeah, I have to physically stop to read the text. Otherwise, it's like my brain can't do it. Like if I'm crossing an wow, intersection, I'll stop reading. And I'm yeah, very, me too. <laughs> I mean, I got hit by a car once like on a bike. So I'm very, when Are I cross a road, I only cross at, no, I wasn't reading. I was, I was driving. <laughs> she, she wouldn't have been hit if she was reading. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's right. I did the same thing as Leah. I got from like Libby, that like app for libraries, for audiobooks. I got Sapiens Thinking before I read it. Like, shoot, I didn't start reading this one early and I had planned on it. And like, I, I now I have the audiobook thinking I'm not going to get through it. But then I started it last night. I'm like, oh, I'm going to get through this in six weeks. I'm sure. Maybe. I haven't started. Well, I'm in the middle of reading another book, so, but I also just feel daunted. Like, I would never buy a yeah. book. Thick, I feel really bad, but I, I like I to know. put it in my bag and carry it places. And I feel like this thick, I'm like, nope, I don't want to read it. That's but true. I like a I tiny will. book. Well, I think we should give you permission to just cut that fucker in half. Yeah. Like physically. People do that. Do it. And just carry half yeah. of it. People. Yeah, why not? That? There's a whole thing on um, that really? Lindsay social media I had. There's like this debate about because there are people, like there's a whole slew of people who are huge readers and commuters. And what they do with big books is they cut them in half and they re they carry half, I like half of the book and carry so, the other. I, might I don't know if I can do that. Because, okay, this reminds me of when I serve my child a big meal. And I know she can put it back, but it's like, if I put the whole burger in front of her, she almost is intimidating to start. But if I cut the burger in half, she'll probably eat the whole fucking thing. <laughs> so whoever feels intimidated by the size, our BI challenge is to cut it in half. I don't know. Just because it'll be so naughty. And if you want to, you can do it naked. I would never. Just carry a big book around with you. Just carry the big book. <laughs> I have trouble, like, even, like, putting, writing my name in a book or anything. Yes. So I'm like, what if I want yeah, to, me I, too. you know, I'm such my mom, it. what if Let's I want to sell naughty. it one day? <laughs> like, sell it. You can sell it for more. You can be like, all these insights are in here. Like, this retails for 20 bucks, but I'm selling it for 30, and that's a discount. Even on Violet Communication, like, when you had to do the quizzes. I was like, I will only use pencil and I'll do it very lightly. Cause just to, like didn't want to write in the book or even or even like tagging. I love writing in all my books. I'm never giving my books away. I'm keeping them forever. I just need more bookshelves. That's my only concern. What's it called? Dog earring? Dog ear. I, that's, I don't even do that. Oh, I, I love use a book it. I've done it, oh. but I always feel bad. Well, I'm sorry. Me book. too. <laughs> I really like the idea of cutting it though. Like if it, if it gets you bringing your book with you and it fits into your bag and it's very practical. If you're cutting it, then you're going to have to put something on the one side so that the papers don't get ripped. Well, let's make our own book covers. We could do some crafts. Oh, <laughs> not cutting the book. I'm not involved in this. I'm against this. Well, you don't have to do it. It's just if you want to do it. I don't know. <laughs> I, I don't think I could do it. I really don't think I could do it. I don't know. I'm going to have to think about it. Cutting the book. And then you have to craft your own book cover thingy. Dust cover. Leah. Just because that's Leah. fun. Leah. Leah. But also, isn't that Kara's book you have? So <laughs> won't you be cutting Kara's book in half? Bob's book. <laughs> or Bob's book? <laughs> yeah. Bob's book <laughs> you can send it back to him in pieces, like ransom. Oh my God. I'll make a glittery. <laughs> yeah. I'll make a glitter one. Bob hates 
glitter more than he hates anything. <laughs> he hates glitter. Page. He hates glitter. He hates sparkle and glitter. We'll make one of the one of the hat contests. The glitter copy of Sapiens. And there's one name in the hat. You know? <laughs> They're like, who ba? <laughs> and the winner is a Christmas mirror one year introduced when we played that game. What's the game called? Where you go around and you trade. The Secret gifts? Santa? Remember the diorama? <laughs> the was diorama so was so hilarious. Was it was so just good. like animals, like mice or something? Like in a living yeah, room? It was ugly. What? But it's it was not like just frame. Secret Santa. It's like you trade gifts where you steal people's gifts. That's right. It's called something, but you trade, like you open a gift and you can keep it or, and then somebody can steal it or. Oh yeah. Whatever that one's called. Yeah. That's what it was. And so this one was hidden within the thing and it was like a framed scene and inside the scene were like mice at a kitchen table or something. It was brown and it was kind of creepy. It was very creepy. And then what the thing was, was you end up with this thing, you had to hang it in your house somewhere and display I love that. For the year. That's my favorite and kind then, of game. And then we bring it back every year. And then somehow, I don't know where it went. I'm thinking it up with Matt, your brother. No, oh, somebody, somebody decided to keep it. They're like, I'm not giving this back. Oh, then maybe it's Matt. <laughs> I Matt remember that would be a Matt move. I displayed it. Yeah, you displayed board. it and showed us. <laughs> yeah, like it it perfectly goes along with all the weird art in my in my place of work. So I was like, yeah. Can we please do that at Christmas ourselves? Like do a secret Santa, but like one gift is the, the this like gift, we'll find right? Something. Like not the thoughtful, like it will be thoughtful, but like thoughtful for reasons of what is the worst piece of art? I have a house. contributing yeah. item. One of Bob's family members who will remain nameless. <laughs> they know who they are. Like, something from I think it was the 60s or 70s and it's a a lamp but it's it's a carved panther <laughs> but I like love it. it's, it's there's velvet and corduroy and those oh, muted greens and yellows and browns yeah. and it's like the panther and it turns into like, like this light I think I might oh, actually I like that like you have it. to send a picture I might actually yeah. want that for my house I want it. We yeah, if that goes it. on the podcast, please put a photo on Facebook. Absolutely. And send it to our Instagram. I think we should have like all of our fans send us all of their things that classify yes. as those. All their know, velvet paintings. All those and velvet panthers. Hot, hot. Yeah. Yeah. That's what we should Creepy call our fans. pictures to the wall. The velvet panthers. <laughs> call them. That would be so fun, though, to get contributions from fans of show us yeah. like the items that you just wish didn't exist. Or you in love. Your life. Depending yeah, or you on love. Domain you fall on. Yeah. Anyways, back to the book. <laughs> um, yeah. No. That we might talk about now. Um, I did watch a TED Talk with, uh, even though I didn't oh. read the book, but with uh, yeah, Yuval Harari. And I found it really interesting that um, he was talking about how cooperation, like how the humans are different from other animals. And he's mm-hmm. talking about how cooperation is the reason that makes us different and flexibility in large numbers and how we mm-hmm. should think about the human race as instead of thinking about yourself as special and important and different to each person, that we need to think about the whole human race. This is just another thing like white fragility about how no, you're actually not special. I mean, you are special, but let's try to think about things in a bigger context, even though we live in a world in which it's a me culture and I'm important and it's all about me. You know, maybe if we thought about things in a bigger context, in a societal context, we could learn more or adapt more. I don't know what you guys mm-hmm. think. That, I really that, like that popped in when you said that it made me think about like how we raise our children, which I, the other day I was talking about it must be such a shock for children that firstborns when the second one comes, it's like all of a sudden, because we raise our children, generally speaking, in this like everything you do, slow clap, bravo. Like <laughs> so when you have the second born come and it's like ripped out of you, your individuality and specialness, it's kind of a good thing almost. And having an only child and only planning to have, I mean, it would take some, some reverse surgeries to have a child with my husband at this point. So <laughs> like you want your kid to feel special and successful, but also like my kid, she thinks she's pretty fucking special. <laughs> like somebody <laughs> needs to talk to her, <laughs> <laughs> but like, you don't want to raise, well, assholes. You want to think of the community. Sarah, you talk about this often in talking about societally in Sangli's culture, it might be more you're successful, then you have to pass along the success. 
mm-hmm. like that kind of mindset is really tricky in maybe the Western culture of ha- of individualism. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. I think it is. It tricks anyone. You just have to <laughs> cultivate it like consciously and and yeah. model it, right? You know, yeah. if you if it's something that's important to you, you know, your kids are learning like 99% of their stuff from watching. They're maybe picking up and listening to, you know, a portion of what you tell them, right? It's just, yeah, if that's what you want. Like I take opportunities to, because sometimes like people be like, ooh, look at your muscles, right? And I'm like, that's great. But also like, show me your kind heart, you know, show me your inclusivity or whatever. You know what I mean? Like I try to put value on the other things too. Value to, on to taking son? care of each other, yeah. right? Yeah. Sometimes it, it starts it, in the household too, right? Like, okay, you can do this chore now because we don't just exist to serve you and bring you your milk or whatever, like. My son got to the point where he's like, can I have this? And you'd be like, yep. And he'd be like, and he would just sit there. And yeah, like, yeah. So go get it. Like you can have it permission granted and now go get it. Like, and that was a bit of a transition because he's an only child and he's got multiple adults doting on him. And so mm-hmm. it starts with your little community of your house. And then I guess you go out into the bigger community and you show up there in the ways you want to. I think it could be subtle though, too. Like when I think about here, like what Leo was saying, when I think about here and they're like, there's. There's some really a very subtle thing that people do here about sharing, right? So let's say Ida has, I don't know, a bag of peanuts or something, right? If we're at a family gathering or a plate like a family's house and people are lots of different adults are there, every single adult will go to her, give me one. And they don't really want a peanut. They expect her oh. to give him them a peanut. They take the one peanut and they go. Everybody does it. Everyone asks her to share. And it's like a cultural norm since they're little, little to give one so that way as they grow up they automatically like have a mentality of always sharing what they have with the people around them that's Mm. nice yeah Mm, and they don't it's not like the adults want it and i had to get used to that because or i'd be like oh i'm okay i don't want one but it's like and then they're offended. Odd. They're like, but I'm sharing with you to show you. Just that take the one yeah, thing, try to eat share it, and be done, yeah. right? Yeah. <laughs> like, I'm allergic <laughs> to peanuts, please. <laughs> <laughs> but, like, it's just those little subtle so, things done from, like. Over and over. Over and over from, like, a young, young age that, like, reinforces things. So I think also, like, it's just like what Kim was saying, though. In your own household, if you do these tiny little things repetitively, it creates like a habit. Do you think it is the process identifying collectively what the values are and then reverse engineering and saying, okay, so what do those values look like when they're played out behaviorally? You do have to do that if your value is, is it- collectivism in an individualistic culture, right? Yes. Because the culture okay. is heavily influencing everybody mm-hmm. all the time. So. Yeah. If you're in that society, then you would have to be like, okay, I want them to learn this. And I know that's not Mm -hmm. something that's inherently kind of subtly taught in our culture. Or Mm. you move to Senegal. (laughs) Yeah, I was just trying to think like, what would be the mechanisms that would allow us be both special and not special and that to not create a status battle royale that indeed our specialness and not specialness is purposeful in that it contributes towards taking care of the whole i don't know well that's the tricky part is like take kids out of it like who cares about kids fuck those guys <laughs> they're on their own but <laughs> they um, think they're so special. like how do you do that for yourself like who here yeah. doesn't feel special like i feel like i'm a special person yeah no i feel course. special Sarah? yeah yeah right. i'm special yeah everyone feels like yeah. generally good oh, about yeah. themselves and that they have a lot to offer right like so how do you hold those two thoughts Mm -hmm. we are in a really individualist culture i wonder how much of that is how we were raised in this culture well something that's interesting that i learned from studying like just indigenous studies is Mm -hmm. rather than viewing it as rights right because that goes individualistic and that's like you're like that's kind of a way of being special right i have the right to this i have the right to that you can view it as i have responsibilities Right. So I have responsibilities mm. to show up this way. I have responsibilities to take care of the bigger or the, the crew or whatever. Right. So I think that's a way to be special because I feel special if I'm doing my responsibilities appropriately. But if you understand that your responsibilities exist outside of yourself, it's not just entitlement. It's it's what you are obligated almost to give. I think that there's a, a opportunity there to frame it in a way that could be tangible. Mm-hmm. Well, I always I say to the too. kids, even 
we're family. Like whenever I get like a pushback on contributing to doing chores or whatever, I'm like, no, we all work together. We're a family, right? We all are in this together. So like, I, I kind of reinforce like they're special, but they're an important part of this unit. Like we're a family. You're an individual who have responsibilities within this. Um, so I kind of do the we same thing up. where it's like, I talk about the family, but I say, cause they notice differences between the expectations of different kids and their families. And I say in this family, we do this. And in this family, everyone's expected to contribute and, you know, make it like, this is the group you belong to. And this is how you will belong. If you want to belong, this is how our family is. So you're expected your responsibilities are to do these following things. And mm, that I think makes it's me like so a, nervous when you said it that. It made me so nervous. Why? Here. Like uh, the, the, I know that's not your, this yeah. is not your intention, but the way you phrase that, if you want to be a part of this. Oh, I don't say that this if is you want to be, but that's like, what you say in the back of your head. Because my head went to like, maybe oh. they won't, won't want to do it that way. And I felt like, oh yeah, it sounds like a threat, right? But I wouldn't say that. But like, because we all want to be part of the group, when you say things like in this family, we give back and we, we are good neighbors and yeah. we take care of our neighborhood. That's what we do in this family. And in the back of their head, because all humans want to be accepted and be part of a group and we're social then part of them will be like, oh, so you're giving them guidelines on how to fit in and everybody mm -hmm. wants to fit in. So if you say like in this, I wonder if whatever. for your kids, is that, does that act as like a juxtaposition to their overriding need to be autonomous? Yes. Because if yeah. you tell mm -hmm. them you have to do this, that is not motivating. They'll just mm -hmm. push back. But if you say in this family, we are good neighbors. Mm -hmm. And uh, when, so when they ask me why I'm doing something, I've said, we're going to do this so that we can be good neighbors. And then they remember that I said before that in this family, we're good neighbors. And like, not mm -hmm. just neighbors to our neighborhood, but good neighbors to other people in the community that we come to. So it's like, why would you do that? They want to know why everything. And they're like, I'm always I'm constantly having to find reasons and then really dig down. Why am I doing this? Because giving back to the community is important. That's something we value. Here are our values. It's kind of like laying out like the family values. Yeah. Yeah, I wonder if that rubbed you a little tingly too, Kara. Yeah, it it was. A, I think it our was family a is a radical acceptance of whatever you want to do. You do it your way. Yeah, it was. Yeah, yeah it was nothing personal against Meredith. Yeah, like no, it's not. At all. I mean, it's not something yeah. I would say. I wouldn't say to them if you want to belong. But that's no, kind of I in know. Your mind that's why that. I'm saying my yeah. spidey sense was like doing. It made me aware of. Oh, that's very different from my experience or something like that from mm -hmm. our family's values night. yeah <laughs> our family's values is yeah i don't know i don't even know i don't, I don't even know but also uniqueness was really valued in your family yeah right? yeah like we do you have not taking care of your mom. unique you yeah right and maybe yeah being, creativity expressing yourself we have a very small family like a yeah. very small we, family. it's just so, yeah i would say the majority of our life it was just the four of us so it's it's not as communal maybe I found, wow. um, I remember Sarah telling me back to Sarah's thing, but, uh, moving to Senegal and her going into one of her family members house. And she felt like she had to ask if she wanted a tea or something. And I remember you telling me, and this always, always stuck with me that they're like, no, no, your family, that my tea is your tea. Right, Sarah? So that really? like, stuff like that is just like well, everything. Like, community. I think yeah. what really was impactful is actually when it came to kids, because when I first visited here, I brought, they were two, two, a two year old and a six month old with my, my big kids. And people were like, oh, we'll go have a nap and relax. And I'll be like, oh, no, I can handle this. And it, people just helped me with my kids and just took my kids or if they're upset, they would take them or change their diaper and did, did, just did it. And I was like, feeling that like guilt. That's when my husband said, he's like, no, they have as much invested in our kids as you do. Like they're just as much entitled to our children as you are. Mm -hmm. No, yep, no. everyone, because mm, we're I a don't family. Like it. We're a family. So mine is mine they, and what's yours is mine. <laughs> <laughs> But that's the thing, like, so I never have to worry. Like, they care just as much about my kids' success or failures. Maybe or it's a trust or whatever. thing. I oh, know. I was just going to say it's totally, kind of I'm like, that would demand of me yeah. to become more comfortable with trust. Yeah, <laughs> oh my God. yeah and it's just there. I think it kind of brings us back to the beginning of this conversation about the ability of humans to work together. 
beginning with Meredith's statement about like belonging to the family or whatever, and the kids wanting explanations for like, why do we do this? Why do we do this? The reason we do this is because if we don't, we die. That's the bottom line. (laughs) We're completely interconnected and there is no individual and everybody, like it's interconnected, interwoven, like the whole system. So there's you as a piece of it, then there's your family and then there's your neighborhood then there's your community and all the way up to the global community. And there's no thing that happens independently without causing an effect to someone else. So that's kind of the, the baseline that I understand for why we do anything because we are not, I don't know what the right word is, but an individual operator. There's no thing we can do that does not involve ripple effects to someone or something in a place where we all share. We don't have separate planets, right? So that's why we want to cultivate these kind of understandings because what we do matters. So there's that special individual uniqueness, but it matters to everybody. We have a responsibility to everybody, including like our planet and the animals, you know, like all of this kind of stuff because Sarah's kids matter to the rest of the people helping her because if they grow up to be functioning members of the community, that's going to be better for everybody. If they grow up to be wounded or hurt in some way, that's going to be a cost to everybody. If you go back to evolution, you know, if you're raising weak sicklies, then you got a weak tribe and you know what I mean? Or whatever, right? Like we have to, because we're all actually one. So yeah, we we're are more like a beehive. One, and then yeah. we are all actually one too. Like we're a giant living, breathing body as well mm-hmm. as single, like we're all like a cell in a giant living body. Mm-hmm. Even Yuval Harari said on the um, TED talk that he was like, you know, I don't know every single person in this room. I don't know the person that set up the equipment that's filming me. I don't know the people that are watching this. I don't know the person who made the internet happen or whatever. I don't know the person that's mining the whatever to make that. So what you're saying, like in the community, we also all need each other just to make this podcast. We probably need hundreds of people just to do this, just for me to communicate with you guys. So how important everybody is as a whole, we are a community, even when we think that we're so individual. I don't know. It's interesting because that's how humans learn too, right? That's why language is so important is that what we know today and the reason we have computers today is not because one person made a computer. It's accumulation of knowledge over like years and years and like a whole bunch of people going together, countless people to get us to where we are today. And that's, that's kind of how humans work. So any person who thinks that like, what I have today, I accomplished all by myself is just lying to themselves because there's nothing that we do today that didn't have somebody that came before and help us do it. Like just the fact that I'm living in a house here, right? You didn't build um, it. I didn't you build it. I didn't learn house. how, I didn't like figure out wiring and electricity and all these things, right? I would say that he touches that on in the book, right? He touches on how he said something about the tools, I guess, were u- used by the homeo erectus. They were the first to use the tool, like the spade or whatever. And one guy and a couple guys in the tribe made it. And then they used that for 2 million years. <laughs> they didn't change it. And then the... The cognitive uh, revolution. Thank you. I love that term. Yeah. Because of all the communication, that. then millions of people worked towards doing things and that's why the human race like homo sapiens not the human race humans humans are there's lots of humans homo sapiens sapiens grew to be what we are because we started using language and cooperating with other people and using our imaginations to create more different better strategies and tools thank you for joining us on this episode of book interrupted if you'd like to see the video highlights from this episode please go to our YouTube channel, Book Interrupted. You can also find our videos on www.bookinterrupted.com. Moments you can look forward to on next week's Book Interrupted. Yeah, it's yeah, just, it's just an part. idea. Like it's just a story an that we all oh. think sounds good, but nobody no, like actually real, has them. A blankie or it was just a signifier. It was a signifier that I wanted to identify new self-concept. I mean, like, you do this recently. It sounds like you're confessing a little bit. I know. Worry that if I leave the burning house, I won't be okay. We are not in harmony with nature. We've given power to imaginary constructs. <laughs> what oh, are they? Such a good. What am I agreeing to? What am I agreeing to? <laughs> <laughs> 
Book interrupted. Never forget, every child matters.